Mr. Robert Bob Bennett, and he's from Houston, and he's a licensing professional, and he's also a licensing consultant. Uh, this is providing us with an hour of uh, CLE credit today, so this is going to be uh, this is going to be a neat uh, subject for us. Uh, Mr. Bennett was licensed in 1974. Uh, he has MAs and BAs and all kinds of A's and a JD from the University of Houston. Uh, He's, uh, he's got his business, Bennett Licensing for Professionals in Houston, but also uh, he's worked for the United States Attorney's Office. He's been general counsel for the Coca-Cola Bottling Company, and he's worked for the ICC. Uh, he's got extensive, uh, extensive published works and honors and awards that he's, uh, that he's been uh, showered with throughout the years. It's page 59 through 61 in your, in your manual here. And of course, uh, he's available should you ever have uh, these types of issues in your own practice. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, available for hire. So uh, he's come here to speak to us today about Veritree Ethics and keeping your law license. So without further ado, Mr. Bennett. Well, thank you, thank very, you much. very much for joining us. Okay, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just gonna speak from here. And uh, I assume that if you can't hear me, you'll raise your hand, but I think you'll probably be able to hear me throughout this presentation. And uh, what I want to start with is that uh, we've handed out this uh, pamphlet, this brochure, and I want to walk you through what uh, the thrust of all this is. Uh, the first word, of course, is bear tree, and you shouldn't do that, so we got that covered. Uh, the second part is ethics, and you should have those, and so we got that covered. The other part deals with your law license, and that's basically where we're going to spend our time today dealing with issues of the law license and what's called the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel, Commission for Lawyer Discipline, and what may happen, I'm sure this has not happened in any of your practices, but what happens quite often in Houston, there may be a dispute with a client over a fee. And if that has never happened to you, you lived a very blessed life, uh, if you keep practicing long enough, I assure you at some point you will have that. And the issue that we're really going to try to grapple with today is the trend with the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel going after attorneys where a grievance has been filed against them and what is a legitimate dispute and what is the outcome. And let's turn first, and let me just go through this with you uh, to this booklet and then we'll kind of launch into the actual cases. So um, the first rule that we're going to be talking about is uh, under tab one, and you see page two, and it's the rule dealing with safekeeping and property. And let me also say that uh, given the informality of this place, and I do like a bar association that meets next to the keg place, I think that's a good juxtaposition, uh, that this is really to be more of a dialogue uh, than a monologue. And so at some point, if you have a question, don't wait to the end if you have some concern. Even if you come in late and, and, uh, and uh, don't pick up the material you're supposed to, we'll take care of that. Probably the best way to do that is say, uh, hypothetically speaking, or I've heard from somebody down the hall such and such, and that way we'll kind of move along. Now, uh, the first rule that's going to impact what we're talking about today is Rule 1.14, Safekeeping Property. And I think we all have sort of a familiar understanding of what that involves. But if you go down to 114C and the very last sentence, it says, if a dispute arises concerning their respective interests, the portion in dispute shall be kept separate, separate by the lawyer until the dispute is resolved and the undisputed portion shall be distributed appropriately. If a dispute arises, and again, I'm sure it never happens in Arlington, but if a dispute arises concerning their respective interests, the attorney, client, or a third party, the portion of dispute shall be kept separate by a lawyer until the dispute is resolved, and the undisputed portion shall be distributed appropriately. The issue then becomes is whether that fee, that amount of money, and it can be uh, monetary, it can be property, it can be anything of value, is it disputed or not, and how, in one case we're going to talk about the David Patrick Smitherman case, which is now up on appeal, how that was the uh, germane and turning point in the whole case as to what was dispute, what evidence was used, what experts were used, and what happened to the actual verdict in that case. 
The next rule deals with 115 on the next page, page three at the bottom of the page, rule 115, declining or terminating representation. And the key to that, and I'm happy, for about 15 years I've represented attorneys before grievance committees, I've represented attorneys uh, in front of uh, district courts, et cetera. So uh, if there's some other issue that's sort of a burning issue as we go through this, and you want to know something that's not directly in the material, I'm happy to address that too. But on this next rule, go down to part D on page four, and this is the sort of catchphrase that catches a lot of attorneys, refunding any advance payments of fee that has not been earned. Refunding any advance payments of fee that has not been earned. And the issue in that case deals with uh, what's called the Clarissa Guajardo case. And we're going to talk about that case. It's a case in which the uh, Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel in Houston decided that in an immigration case, the uh, procedure and theory that was used by Clarissa Guajardo resulted in an amount of money that should have been returned to the client. Uh, the uh, case went to trial in front of a jury. The court directed a verdict, and uh, the, then the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel appealed it to the First, First Circuit in Houston, and the verdict was returned in favor of Ms. Guajardo. So we're going to go into some more details about that as we go along. Um, the next I want to talk about uh, is go over to page 7. And that deals with uh, a case that I have some interest in. It talks about minimizing the burdens of delays of litigation. In the course of litigation, a lawyer shall not take a position that unnecessarily increases the cost or other burdens of the case or that unreasonably delays resolution of that matter. And exactly what that means, how that's been interpreted, why that was a grievance and the result of that case. Um, on page two, uh, we're talking about the Smitherman case, and there's a letter that at your leisure you can look at dealing with uh, what Mr. Smitherman is presently going through with the uh, Office of Chief District Counsel. Won't spend a whole lot of time on that except it makes very interesting uh, reading as to the way the procedure was used. And the uh, uh, interesting part of that also is that there was a jury verdict. Uh, the uh, uh, judgment form was presented to the court uh, by Mr. Smitherman, who pro se represented himself, uh, the court uh, then held up until a JNOV motion was filed by the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel. The judge disregarded the jury finding and entered the JNOV, and that's now the issue up on appeal. And so we're going to kind of struggle with some of the issues in that case, how it came about, the procedure used, and what does that mean for future grievance cases. So that's the Smitherman case. Uh, the next case there I've, I've talked about briefly uh, is a letter from Clarissa Guajardo and her experience with the uh, board, uh, the commission. Under the next tab five is the actual decision of the case with Clarissa Guajardo and their interpretation of an unearned fee and what uh, uh, the strategy was in that case. One of the other interesting things that goes throughout all three cases is that this is one area of the law in which the Office of Chief District Counsel does not use experts. And if you try to use an expert, they'll object to it if, if it's either in front of the court or the uh, jury. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting phenomena that if you do these grievance cases, you come to understand that they really don't want to have somebody giving an expert opinion, which is kind of an interesting uh, a quirk to this type of litigation. The other part that I think hopefully will be uh, beneficial to you uh, is under tab six, and that is the uh, contract that was the subject of litigation uh, in my case. And you have that case, and I skipped over this, but I want to go back to just call your attention to uh, Mr. Smitherman's contract. And I believe that is, uh, I'm sorry, under tab three. So you have two contracts here that you can use to compare with your own contracts. My sense is 
uh, except for you know some attorneys from Dallas. I understand they've kind of snuck in here, and that's all right. I guess we let them come, right, Mr. President? So besides those people from, from Dallas that sneak in here, most of you probably have small practices and from time to time use written contracts, okay? Uh, these are two contracts that if you've never used an arbitration clause, uh, and are interested in what the law is now about that, uh, that would be an interesting area to discuss if you want to go into it. In the Smitherman contract, there is a very uh, uh, one paragraph dealing with arbitration and how that played into his uh, grievance. Uh, in the Bennett case, there's a very extensive arbitration clause, and we'll talk more about that also. So you have two contracts that I want to call your attention to under... Uh, Tab, five, top, tab six and under Mr. Smitherman's. The next, uh, and this is, um, I know that there's a fee dispute resolution committee in Dallas that handles cases. I assume that probably Arlington doesn't have one that's formalized. Am I correct? Correct. Is that okay. correct? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but again, if you are practicing either in Houston or practice where one, where you have a fee dispute resolution committee, that is a uh, vehicle that I think you should be familiar with and what that in, entails, how that operates, and whether you want to uh, submit your fee dispute with a client to that committee. Tarrant County. Tarrant County has one, okay. And so I, I haven't read those rules, but I assume they're pretty similar throughout the state. And the big issue with a fee dispute resolution committee is that it only deals with fee disputes, nothing else. And uh, there are some issues dealing with whether that's appealable or not appealable. And uh, the big advantage, obviously, to that type of vehicle being the Fee Dispute Resolution Committee is that you can get to a hearing much quicker than a trial, generally speaking. And uh, uh, generally speaking, if it's uh, not a big issue, you can get a decision fairly rapidly. Uh, in the cases that I've handled at Houston, we've had decisions uh, in days and weeks as opposed to months and years. So that's one of the advantages there. Uh, so the, the, the fee dispute uh, resolution rules are under tab seven. Under tab eight uh, is an important statute, the Texas Arbitration Act, and I'll tie that into some of the cases we're gonna talk about and the fact that you always have a right to an appeal even with an arbitration under certain circumstances. Not, an absolute, uh, not a complete, but you do have a right to appeal. Uh, point, uh, somebody asked me about uh, information of contact, and that's with the resume of page uh, 9. Page 10 is the most uh, recent ethics opinion, and an ethics opinion is uh, uh, advisory. It's not precedential uh, as far as a, a brief is concerned, but certainly is advisory and can be cited. And this case deals with uh, this issue again of uh, disputed fees and on page 66 under page 10, why this is important is uh, in the last paragraph on page 66, it says in a case involving disputed fees claimed by a lawyer rather than disputed fees held by a lawyer, it's an important distinction, the discussion above of rules 1.14 and 115D would not apply because no client property held by a lawyer would be involved. And again, this goes to the issue of when you're talking to your client about whether there's a fee, whether it's disputed, whether you're holding it or not, or whether there is a part of it that's not disputed. So all that goes into what your rights and responsibilities are dealing with your client if there is a uh, uh, dispute over a fee. Uh, the check comes into you uh, and the client comes in and, and uh, you know you settled this uh, rear ender for uh, $10,000 and uh, you have a contract with the uh, obviously contingency fee, you have a contract with this client and the client comes in and says well and I've had this happen uh, it's my case, it's my injury, I want all the money or, you know, I think you're charging too much. Again, probably never happened in Arlington, but happens in, in Houston. So the question then, if you make the statement, well, I think that uh, certainly I'm entitled to some of this and you're entitled to some of it too. Uh, if you say $3,000, five, whatever you, you're saying, that amount that you have stated that is not in dispute has to be paid 
or you're in violation of this rule, okay? So I want to be sure this is really clear because this resulted in a humongous lawsuit and the information here with Mr. Smitherman, which we'll talk about. Now, if you say all of this is in dispute, then under that rule and under there's a, a brochure that the Texas Bar puts out called uh, Handling of Trust Funds, and it states in that brochure that you're at risk if you pay money that's uh, uh, in dispute and you don't know exactly what amount is owed. So you get kind of a double whammy if you say this is all in dispute and you also are bound by this rule and bound by what the state bar has published in its trust uh, rules and regulations. So again, if you're talking to a client and you say the whole amount is in dispute and you say, I'm gonna keep it here in my trust account, I'll keep it in my trust account until we either arbitrate this, if you have an arbitration clause, or the court reaches a resolution, then you're in good shape. If you say, you know, $5,000 is uh, what you're owed for this $10,000, but since I really don't like you, I'm gonna keep it all, you have just got yourself a grievance if it goes through that system. You've got yourself a grievance because you're to pay the amount that's not in dispute. Now, I see some kind of quizzical looks from some of my audience, and I'm gonna stop right there before we launch into these cases, and I show you how these cases were handled by the Office of Chief Discipline Counsel, Commission of Lawyer Discipline. Is there any question about where I am at this point? And I wanna be sure because I think this is something that maybe somebody has overlooked or has a concern about. Okay, moving on. Uh, the arbitration, if you're interested in whether or not you should use an arbitration clause in your contract, and for my practice of over 40 years, I generally like to have an arbitration clause, and I generally put it in dealing with in Houston, Houston Fee Dispute Resolution Committee, because of the quickness, and usually there's not that much uh, resolved, and you can always mediate even that dispute. But in this uh, decision, it deals with whether or not you put what your duties are to advise your client about an arbitration clause, okay? And you have an affirmative right to advise your client about that. Now, what I have done in my uh, contract and the contract that you have with you is that I advise them if they want to, they can seek a third opinion or seek a third party opinion or seek another lawyer's opinion. I've only had that happen maybe once or twice, but at least you've put in there that the issue of arbitration has been fully discussed and they've been made aware of the pros and cons of the arbitration. The, the, the decision here, or the, the uh, uh, opinion, says it's not required for you to uh, uh, absolutely make it mandatory for them to seek a, another uh, attorney's opinion, but you can certainly make that recommendation. So that is one approach. Uh, some people don't like arbitrations at all. Some people think they're a waste of time. Some people understand they're giving up their right to dis discovery, the right to jury trial, in some cases the right to appeal in some, in some circumstances. And so there's certainly pros and cons about that. So uh, that is the material that's been uh, presented to you so far. Yes? You're talking about an arbitration clause that would contemplate a fee dispute, right? Well, I mean, you can have an arbitration clause uh, on anything that, as long as it doesn't, uh, you can't arbitrate, uh, I can file a legal malpractice case, obviously. But as far as anything else, as far as either venue, as far as uh, who the arbitrator would be, we would agree to who the arbitration would be in front of. So, so yes, generally what I'm talking about today is a fee dispute, but the arbitration clause can be as broad as you want it as long as it doesn't interfere or impact with grievance rules. Well, for issue of public policy, if they agree to the arbitration clause, can that be seen as prohibiting them from going through the state bar grievance process? You can't do that, no. 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 So they get two bites. If they don't like the outcome of the arbitration, they can still go back to the state bar. Yes. Uh, you practice in our glorious state by privilege, not by right, and the rights held by the state bar. And so far, uh, you can file a grievance. Anyone, not necessarily your client, can file a grievance on just about anything they want to. 
Now, whether it goes forward or not is a whole different can of worms. But uh, yeah, you can, and you can't eat. It's not a grievable offense for you to write in your contract you can't file a grievance, okay? It would probably, if there are other issues that came up, would probably not look good for you, okay? Uh, it's the same thing about this whole issue about non-refundable fees, but that's another talk. Okay, let's get into kind of what this is all about. Um, uh, how do you handle a client who does not want to pay you or believes owes you money or doesn't believe he owes you money? What about an arbitration clause in your employment agreement? If the client sues you and files a grievance, how should you respond? There, uh, the cases we're gonna deal with is again, uh, the Patrick Smitherman case and the uh, Clarissa Grajardo case are the first two. And in Patrick Smitherman, uh, Mr. Smitherman uh, was involved in a securities dispute uh, and had four or five clients that were involved in this securities dispute. And his contract, that he used is in this under his name um, and it did have a very simple arbitration clause. So that's an important thing to know. Uh, the case got settled for about uh, $550,000, you know, a significant amount. Uh, when the check came in in 2009, uh, Mr. Smitherman, who also one of the clients was his father, wrote a check to his father uh, wrote a check to another client, wrote a check to himself for attorney's fees, okay? Then there was a client by the name of Perry that Mr. Smitherman had known for a long period of time. In fact, at one time, they were uh, next door neighbors. And there was about $220,000 that was still being contested or there was an issue with. And so Mr. Smitherman wrote a letter to Mr. Perry stating, uh, dear Perry, uh, I know that there may be a dispute. Oh, one other important point that I forgot. There was an agreement for a bonus. There was an agreement for a bonus. Now, the bonus was not set forth in the contract, but at the time of trial, at the time of deposition, Mr. Perry agreed that he had promised a, a bonus. It wasn't exactly determined what it was, but there had been conversations of it around twenty dollars to $50,000. Uh, point being, if you're going to have a bonus, Need to spell it out. So, Mr. Perry, of course, when he got this letter, and this is an important date of uh, October the 16th of 29, uh, he went out and hired an attorney. Uh, the attorney then on the 22nd wrote back to uh, Mr. Smitherman saying to him, we are going to sue you, we're going to sue the law firm you're with, and you owe us this amount of money. At that point, according to Mr. Smitherman, this is the key to this whole thing, that amount, the whole amount that was owed, plus the bonus, was in dispute. Now, that would be sort of a clean case. That would be sort of a clean case. What happened was that in the conversations and emails, there was a reference that Mr. Smitherman said, you know, I think maybe a $50,000 fee is appropriate as kind of a throwaway lie. Not saying that he was gonna settle for that, not saying that's the final thing, but I think what we do need to do is arbitrate this according to the clause. Uh, another year went by, the case was finally arbitrated, settled. But the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel, attorney by the name of Tim Bursch, decided that since Mr. Smitherman had said that there was $50,000 and the rest of it basically was not in dispute, even though that wasn't what Mr. Smitherman said other places, and that certainly wasn't his intent, that was a violation of the rules of ethics. And because of that, a grievance was filed against him, and for three years it was litigated, okay? Now, what happened after the, at the time of the trial is that Mr. Smitherman actually submitted those issues dealing with that uh, part of the case and um, <clears throat> first issue was did David Patrick Smithman upon receiving the $550,000 in settlement funds in which R. Bradford Perry had an interest and upon request by Mr. Perry, failed to promptly render a full accounting regarding those funds. Uh, did he provide a full accounting? 
So that was the first jury issue. And with that issue, the jury said, yes, he did. He provided an accounting. The second issue with regard to the $550,000 settlement funds in which both David Patrick Smitherman and all Bradford Perry claimed interest, did Mr. Smitherman fail to appropriately distribute the undisputed portion of the funds? And the answer was no, he didn't because the testimony trial was from Mr. Smitherman is the entire amount was in disputed, was disputed, and he did not owe the $50,000 until it had been resolved by the court, uh, actually in arbitration. So the jury came back and he, uh, Mr. Smitherman won on both of those accounts. Well, what happened next was the trial judge, after the uh, attorney for the Office of Chief Discipline Counsel filed a motion for JNOV, granted that JNOV, and this gets to be really uh, more technical than probably we have time to do here, but in the motion for the JNOV, the date that hadn't been presented at trial as to the time that that money was considered to be undisputed was changed by the attorney of the Office of Chief Discipline Counsel. The judge went along with that and the grievance was finalized and he was found to have committed professional misconduct. Now this gets even more convoluted in this form. Uh, there was a sanctions hearing uh, uh, about six months after this and in the sanctions hearing the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel, and this deals with, it's called Disciplinary Rule of uh, Procedure 310. And under that, there's 12 aspects to that sanctions hearing in front of a either a court, or in front of courts. You can't have a jury trial on that issue. So the, the court says shall consider, and those are such things as uh, any other previous uh, grievances, uh, uh, injury to the client, uh, injury to the profession, so the 12 sections that go through. At this sanctions hearing, the Office of Chief Discipline Counsel did not put on a witness or introduce any evidence, but said due to how, this, how long the case tr was tried and due to uh, the difficulty of whatever, they recommended a two years suspended sentence. So the sanctions against Mr. Smitherman was two years where he couldn't practice law. Now, he did file a motion to abate the proceeding since it was before a jury, and the court granted that, and so uh, right now his case is on appeal. So, uh, um, and, and, and trying to draw what you can use from this in your own practice if there is a dispute with a client in the Smitherman case, I would conclude there are a couple of things. One, uh, you gotta be real careful whether the amount is in dispute or not. If it's not in dispute, you have to pay it. Uh, on the other hand, if the, there is amount that's in dispute, you're required by both this statute and the trust rules to hold that in a uh, uh, IOLTA account or in a uh, trust account. And if that doesn't happen, it exposes you to this type of grievance if the client goes ahead and files a grievance. So there's a lot more to the Smitherman case. You can see in the letter, uh, you can see in the stuff that's been written about it. If you're really that interested in it and have something similar, all this is online in the Harris County uh, Courthouse and with the First Circuit. So uh, it's... I'm probably, you know, beating a dead horse several times here, uh, but I just want to be sure that it's clear as to the disputed and undisputed, and you have a good understanding about that. Uh, the, there was an arbitration clause there. They did finally arbitrate. It did get settled. So that's the Smitherman case. The second case deals with a case involving Clarissa Guajardo. And in Clarissa's case, there's a different statute dealing with unearned fee. And if you turn with me in your uh, booklet, the uh, case itself is set forth uh, under tab five. Uh, Clarissa Guajardo uh, graduated a and with the University of Texas, uh, basically practices immigration law in Houston. 
uh, she had a client that called her up and explained that uh, the client's fiance had uh, come over to marry an American citizen. She was a Mexican citizen. She was stopped at the border. There's some issues about what she said when she was questioned by immigration. They sent her back. And so uh, the client wanted to hire uh, a Clarissa to uh, get uh, citizenship or at least get her back in the United States legally. So I think there was like a $5,000 fee paid. Uh, uh, Clarissa went to work immediately, filing a, a Freedom of Information Act, filing various forms with the federal government uh, to try to find out what was going on with the case. She decided that there was a uh, need to file and you can only do this, uh, I don't do the immigration, but just following the case, a writ of a writ, habeas corpus in Washington, D.C. against the Immigration Department so that she could suppress the statements that the woman made crossing the border because she made some statements under duress that she hoped to get out, to keep out of the case. Uh, she had trouble getting that filed. She had trouble getting uh, somebody to do it. It was ultimately dismissed. The money dealing with that part of the case she, there was some in her account. She had then applied that to other parts of the case, trying to make the case go forward. As at this point, the client said, stop, you're wasting my time. I don't think you're doing what I want. Uh, and, uh, and the client had paid these amounts. They've been billed and paid, okay? Uh, and the client said, I don't, uh, I want another attorney on this. And she will show you she was terminated. At the time that she was terminated, the client said, Unless you give me all the money back, I'm going to uh, file a grievance against you. Uh, a grievance was filed. And at the time of the uh, trial, and this was tried to jury in Harris County, you have the decision there. What happened was the uh, evidence showed that the uh, activity that Clarissa did with the writ of habeas corpus was in furtherance of the client's best interest. And there was no evidence, no expert, uh, no one testified against that theory, that strategy, and the court directed a verdict, okay? That directed verdict, you think, well, the Office of Chief Justice Counsel should be satisfied that, you know, a court has uh, final, finally resolved the case, uh, but uh, no, they decided to go ahead and appeal it. And that's the appellate decision that you have there talking about how there was no evidence that this was an unearned fee, that the money was appropriately used in the best interest of the case. Um, the interesting thing, some other parts of both what I talked about in the Smitherman case and in the uh, Guajardo case is that uh, there was not an expert used by uh, anyone in the case to try to help the court or the jury uh, determine what is the right ethics in this. Uh, the uh, uh, Office of Chief District Counsel often doesn't even, it states in the letter from uh, uh, Guajardo, they had not even met the uh, complaining witness until the time of trial, no discovery is done, and so the preparation was somewhat sketchy, and at the time that the appellate decision came down, the Office of Chief District Counsel threatened, unless uh, Clarissa would take a public reprimand, to take it to the Supreme Court. Ultimately, that didn't go forward and the case was resolved. So that was kind of the strong-handed tactic that was used in that case. Okay, so we've gone through uh, both Smitherman and Clarissa Gorhardo. Uh, any comments, any uh, questions about either one of those cases in light of fee dispute, in light of what the tactics were of the Office of Chief District Counsel or the ultimate decision? Uh, just from a technical perspective, <coughs> keeping funds separate, all right, uh, from an IOLTA account or something, if there's a if there's a disputed portion of the funds, how far do you have to go to keep that separate? What do you got to do? I mean, you have to create another account, or you know, that's a very good question. And uh, there, there's uh, uh, best practices. Best practices would be yes to create another account. Okay, that's not required. That's not required, but if you want to go in in front of either the uh, evidentiary panel or stand in front uh, or try in the initial stages of agreements to show how you wanted to be sure there's no issue, that would be a nice fact. Okay.
okay, that I was, I wanted to be sure that everybody was taken care of, the client was, uh, uh, everybody knew that there was no chance of commingling, and so at First State Bank, I made a IOTA, K, IOTA account under the name of John Smith. Okay. And that's where the money is, and your uh, printout shows it. Okay. okay. That would be a, the best practices. It's not required. Okay. Are you ever required to interplead the funds? Uh, you're not required unless there's an order office in the court to do that, and and it's it's sufficient to keep that in an iota or as we said in another account. There's no requirement to do it. Uh, again, if you're trying to, uh, you know, if, if there's not an arbitration case, uh, the client has sued you. Uh, you want to uh, uh, come with completely clean hands. I can see a situation where you would interplead it. Say. You know, you sued me. You're trying to get. I don't have. Any, I don't have control of these funds. But now with the uh, district clerk, and so I, I don't have any problem with that strategy either. In fact, it probably is. is uh, it falls in the category of best practice. What if it's a third party, not the client, but a third party? Same, same applies. I mean, you the same responsibility. Uh, both the rule and the trust uh, regulations state that if there's a dispute, you distribute that and says this at your own peril. What to me, it? that sounds like, you know, you shouldn't do it if it's disputed and you can't determine exactly who owes and how much it is. What if the statute of limitations has expired uh, for the adjudication of that claim? Boy, now we're getting into, uh, you need to give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> That's getting really technical. Uh, statute of limitations for a grievance is five years. Now, statute of limitation for the lawsuit, statute of limitation for the grievance, uh, you know, You'd be in pretty good shape. Statute limitations to adjudicate the amount owed. Well, I could see a situation even if that has run out and you still had exposure uh, under the five-year ethics rule that that might be a problem. Okay, but I, all of that deals with first of all, and what it says in here is that you, when that settlement happens, the first requirement is notice. Okay. Now you can't hold back and say, "Well, now it's run out five minutes, and then you never gave notice," because that will get you in trouble. Right. So you've done everything. You you uh, try to get a hold of them. You can't find them. Yada yada yada. All that stuff. Then that's a different thing. And that even that situation, uh, I might even interplead that just to make sure there's no one coming back or a relative comes back or somebody's died. I mean, you know, if we're talking about two hundred bucks, no big deal. Twenty million, kind of a big deal. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, office of the disciplinary council, chief disciplinary council, was threatening to take this one up to the Supremes. How often do they threaten tactics like that, and are they bound by the same rules as the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you have not done grievance work. Uh, I, I was listening to NPR, and NPR was talking about how some of our big banks are uh, kind of doing some of the practices they did under the theory that if you're, you know, a multinational huge bank and you do some of this, nobody's going to do anything to you, okay? Applying that same theory to the uh, Office of Chief District Counsel, there, there are certain people that are kind of the gurus in this area. One is a woman by the name Lillian Hardwick, Bob Schur of the University of Houston. They have three volumes, big stuff. Um, Jim McCormick in Austin. Uh, Chuck here and these guys and gals that I've talked to, they can't think of a single instance where a disciplinary council has ever been disciplined. They can't think of a single instance where a Rule 13 violation, you, and in fact, uh, Mr. Smitherman, in his case, filed a Rule 13, after he won the case, okay, filed a Rule 13 for sanctions and for expenses and it was dismissed. So that is one of my crusades is that the Office of Chief uh, Disciplinary Council, Disciplinary Council, uh, are completely immune at the present time. And we just, and in fact, the new pamphlet that came out from the Commission for Law and Discipline talks about some of the uh, cases they have handled with prosecuting DAs, the Morton, Michael Morton case, for instance, DAs, uh, the uh, uh, Office of Dis Chief Disciplinary Council was involved in that, a guy by the name of, uh, uh, Anthony Graves uh, case that I was involved in getting the, the uh, grievance filed against the uh, district attorney in that case and that's going forward uh, they talk about you know how we've involved with 
making sure DAs, if they do something wrong, can be grieved, judges, but they never talk about the palace guards. Okay? And that's wrong, as far as I'm concerned. So that's, that's another lecture. I'll, that's next year's lecture. Okay. Um, we're going to go... It's, it's, Real quickly, I'm going to talk just a minute about uh, the Bennett case, which is very, very interesting. And it deals with uh, the, uh, the contract, which I think is there, interesting, uh, that you have in your, in your brochure. And the interesting thing about that, there are three places in that contract where it references that you should go talk to another attorney. Uh, my thought was that if you are dealing with arbitration and the case itself, and I don't have time to go into it a lot, was kind of a quirky case. Uh, you needed to have an attorney look at it. And an attorney looked at it. In fact, not only an attorney looked at it, but a sitting appellate judge who is a family friend of the complainant, Mr. Land, a judge by the name of Hollis Horton down in, uh, I believe, Corpus, wrote a letter to Mr. Land saying, I've looked at this, these are my opinion, da da da, uh, but I can't really you know, bail you, I'm, I'm sitting judge, da da da. So he received legal advice at the time of the contract, and the contract was written, okay? We go forward, of course he gets unhappy, thinks I charged him too much. He then, uh, uh, we have an arbitration clause, we go to arbitration, the arbitration goes against me. I decide under the rules of both the Houston Bar Association and of the Texas uh, Arbitration Act, I have a right to appeal. I take that appeal, a grievance is filed, uh, the grievance ends up being tried to a judge by the name of Carmen Kelsey, who is a was a sitting juvenile judge who not only had never tried a disbarment case, had never tried a civil case. Well, I had the pleasure of being an assistant U.S. attorney in San Antonio over there for altogether three years, brought over the president, former president of the San Antonio Bar Association, a real close friend of mine by the name of Dan Naranjo, she would not let him or any of my other experts testify because, in her words, I, uh, I don't need to be told what the law is. Okay, so we go forward. She finds a committed professional misconduct doing this. One, I took a, I delayed it by taking an appeal, even though I have an absolute right to. And then, at the time that I was fired, there was an unearned fee. Well, we had documented, and this didn't become part of the case, uh, because we had documented that... Uh, he had been billed monthly, and all the money had been distributed according to our fee agreement, okay? Uh, but that was one of the issues in the case. Uh, the uh, judge not only uh, decided to uh, find that a committed professional misconduct, but entered a disbarment order. Uh, and so that was a little bit unusual. Uh, that's now on appeal, uh, and we feel very comfortable uh, for a variety of reasons that hopefully will be changed by the Court of Appeals. But that's what can happen dealing with one of these issues of a fee dispute and how you don't want that to happen to you. So I think we're at one o'clock. I'm gonna be cognizant of your uh, time. I'm happy to, uh, I think I have a Griffin salad here that I haven't had a chance to eat, so I'm gonna hang around and eat my salad. You have my name and number if there's an issue there, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I did not charge the $700 that some of the CLEs cost, so uh, I hope you appreciate that and uh, enjoy being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.